are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. It's time for us to channel, tackle, however you want to put it. So I'll put it that way. It's time for us to tackle a critical social question, which is what happened to Scott Adams, the Dilbert guy? His cartoons used to be pretty funny, really funny and clever, but he became kind of a Trump MAGA nut. Now, this may not seem like the most uh, portentous issue of the moment. Nevertheless, we're going to talk about it. Uh, my next guest, she's been on the program before, is Ashling McRae. She is Podmaster General at Current Affairs, as well as an editor and writer there. And of course, you know, Current Affairs, Nathan J. Robinson is a regular guest here, uh, as is Lyda Gold, and of course, Ashling herself. And for those of you who are constantly bothering me on social media about not spelling my guest names, it's A-I-S-L-I-N-G, Ashling McRae, M-C-C-R-E-A. Without any further ado, Ashling, thanks for coming back on the program. Thank you for having me. Now, I said in my introduction that there are those who might... Uh, question the gravity of the topic of Dilbert itself, but every topic doesn't have to be grave, for one thing. Uh, but why did you write about uh, Scott Adams in the Dilbert cartoon? Yeah, well, I mean, I started writing it maybe about three months ago, so it wasn't quite, uh, uh, you know, there wasn't quite as much going on um, as there is now. Um, but I think even... So uh, maybe Dilbert isn't on everyone's mind all the time, like it, like it is for me. I think looking at these sort of more niche or seemingly less important aspects of culture can tell us something about the more important political questions. So that's something I often try to approach in my work is to look at something that's a little more what people might think of as apolitical or like a minor cultural phenomenon and say, okay, well, how does this fit into the wider political context? And also um, Dilbert was just something I'd been thinking about for a while because I had a long um, interest in it, but also uh, Scott Adams had kind of in the last couple of years become a bit more of a notorious media figure. And so it kind of felt like a, uh, a good time to reflect uh, on Dilbert. You know, uh, yeah, and besides, it's fun. Right? And it's fun. Uh, we can have fun. Um, it's allowed. It is per absolutely permitted. Um, now, it, it's funny. You mentioned uh, getting intrigued by the cartoon when you were a child. Mm. Uh, I was an adult when it came out, but I always thought it was at times very clever, very funny, uh, insightful. Um, but the fact that someone writes a funny cartoon for a few years and is very successful at it does not make them a world altering genius. And as Scott Auto Adams started uh, talking about Trump, but not only about Trump, about society in general, he started projecting a kind of megalomania that was striking to me because I always assumed the point of the cartoon, which I'm sure most people remember, you know, guy working in cubicles and, you know, he has a dog named Dogbird and an adversary in the company named Catbird and his manager is always, you know, ridiculously wrong about everything. I always thought it was, you know, meant to be mildly subversive of corporate culture, but Adams not only started becoming an egomaniac, but as you pointed out, I didn't know, uh, he was actually uh, kind of an ally of corporate culture, too. So what's that all about? Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at um, satire, people assume that satire is inherently anti-authoritarian or at, against the thing that it's satirizing, but people can come from it from a more complicated position. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Chris Morris, the, the UK um, satirist and, and comedian. I'm not. Okay, he's this a brilliant um, satirist. He did uh, this great film called Four Lions, which is about... Oh, sure. uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, which is about uh, these four wannabe uh, jihadi terrorists. And he did this um, satirical news show called uh, The Day to Day. Brilliant. People should check out his work. Um, but he, um, he doesn't do very many interviews in this kind of thing, but, but he uh, did a memorable interview where he talked about how with satire, you really need to think about your intentions and are you actually, I believe his words were, um, are you just doing a, a dance for the court? Like, is this actually satire that is going to upset people or is it actually subversive or are you just having a bit of fun with people who, whose ideas you're not actually opposed to. Um, I think that's worth remembering when you look at stuff that's supposed to be satirical is like, like how toothy is it or, or is it toothless, right? And with Scott Adams, it's easy to assume at first glance, oh, he's doing this uh, uh, comic that satirizes workplace culture. And there are a lot of things in there that I'm sure he genuinely dislikes or, or disagrees with but that's not necessarily a sign that he has diagnosed the actual source of the problem or that he's against the whole system right he actually i believe he had like an M he got an mba and he had various businesses and stuff so he's he's not an anti business or an anti corporate guy uh, by any means well you know it's interesting ashley mccray because uh as you were talking, I was thinking, uh, reflecting on the cartoons I've read by him. <clears throat> and uh, if anything, uh, he, Scott Adams and Dilbert could be interpreted as a technocratic kind of prop propaganda. The engineers are always smart and wise and superior. The manager, who is not an engineer, is a buffoon. Uh, you could argue now that, particularly now that you've told me that uh, Scott Adams has an MBA, you could argue that what he's really mocking are uh, the non-elites who shouldn't be in positions of power because the smart ones like him and like the engineers should be, as opposed to this is an unjust system. Maybe he's just saying, you know, some people are unworthy of the autocratic power of the boss. I mean, you know, you could you could take that angle on it, I too. Think you I definitely suppose. could, yeah. And... Uh, you know, it occurred to me in reading your article, I, as I read it, I was trying to think, what exactly is the Dilbert formula, which always seems so fresh and original, but you kind of hinted at there being a formula. And I think it's something like, you know, step one, manager makes an absurd request. Uh, step two, uh, engineers point out absurdity of request step three uh, manager inverts absurdity you know the pointed out absurdity with a meta absurdity and step four he says and have it on my desk by monday that's you know there's a I'm not, that's not exactly it but there's a dilbert formula and um don't you think that oh, there's a formula? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of a lot of the the comics are in that formula or something similar. I mean, the thing with a a, a three or four uh, panel comic strip is you can't, by its nature, do anything too deep or complex, right? Like you can't do sort of detailed character work. Like you can sort of build the characters over time, but it also needs to be accessible to some person who picks up the newspaper and has never seen it before. So you kind of need to work in these broad archetypes. You can't explore a complex idea. So it does have to be this very neat sort of um, set up punchline, uh, post punchline kind of formula. And what was interesting is um, Scott Adams, he not only did the comic strips, but he wrote a lot of books. And when you read his books, his books are actually in a very similar format. So he will take, I don't know, a topic like um, family or dating or technology. And he will say, uh, you know, well, X, therefore Y, and therefore punchline, or and therefore conclusion. And it's never a, a deep, Deep analytical look it is always a um it's always a very simplified you know quick turnaround style and the thing is that you know that works for a comic strip but with his books sometimes it's very difficult to tell 
is this just supposed to be a comedy book? Is this supposed to just make us laugh or, or is he serious? And part of the point in my article is I think he kind of bought into his own uh, way of looking at things. He kind of took that very uh, simplified, uh, you know, premise, therefore conclusion, and maybe I'm joking and maybe I'm not, and just applying that to his, to his whole life and his politics and everything. You come up with Ashley McRae in this piece. I think you coined this word sophoid, uh, S-O-P-H-O-I-D, meaning, uh, well, soft, soft from sophist, Sophia of wisdom, and oid meaning something like a piece of wisdom. So a kind of pseudo, wi- pseudo wisdom, is that what you might call it, or a pseudo observation or a pseudo insight? What's a sophoid? Yeah, so uh, a, a- Sophoid is something that has the shape or sort of sounds like wisdom, but isn't really. Um, and this is something that kind of works for um, jokes or little things like um, um, amusements. Like if you think about, for example, uh, like Yogi Berra's famous lines and stuff, they can seem to sometimes have a kind of uh, uh, strange wisdom to them. Or um, the example I give in the article is... Uh, In one strip, uh, this character, Wally, says, I never wash my towels because when I use my towel, I've just got out of the shower, so I am completely clean, so the towel gets cleaner every time that I touch it, right? And that's something that, like, sort of has a logic to it at first, Um, but then if you know anything about how, like, hygiene works, and of course it's not actually true, right? And uh, this is part of the point... I think is that when Scott Adams talks about politics or anything that is more serious or complex, um, he tends to use a lot of this theorizing or or way of thinking that sort of sounds like it has a logic to it, but uh, doesn't really. So it's like insight for lazy people who don't want to be bothered actually having insights. It's... Uh, it gives you the endorphin rush of an insight without actually being insightful. Yeah, I, I guess you could put it that way, sure. So, and of course, we have a whole politics based on that. You could argue, not to stretch a point too far, that that's what MAGA politics is too, and a lot of politics on both sides, you know, whether it's, gee, a uh, country ought to do its budget like folks sitting around the kitchen table trying to, uh, you know, balance the household budget. You know, I mean, that's a soft way. You could name a million of them once you get started. No pain, no gain. Uh, who says? Why is pain good, right? But it it sounds so insightful. So uh, I guess when it comes to Scott Adams and Dilbert, I you know, I still think I looked at a couple more. I still think it's funny. Uh, are are we still allowed? to think it's funny uh, now that we know all this about Scott Adams and the sophoid process? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the thing is, it's still undeniably a skill, right? I think you can admire a skill. And obviously, like, the, the whole question of, you know, can you separate the art from the artist is obviously a massively complicated question, and, you know, we don't have time to get into that today. Um, but to an extent, I think it just depends on how, um, you know, how much is it actually having an effect if you uh, read this artist's work, right? Like, I don't really want to give money to Scott Adams, but yeah. if I if I see one of his comic strips online and I laugh at it, and it's not a joke that's at the expense of something I care about, I don't I don't think that that's wrong, right? We can still appreciate uh, a skill uh, without uh, kind of punishing us ourselves for. Um, liking something by someone with bad politics. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. And I guess my closing closing thought, and I'll give you a closing thought, Ashley McRae, but my closing thought is, look, you know, comedy is based on a quick inversion of assumed outcomes, to, for lack of, I mean, you know, the philosopher Henri Bergson put it a lot better than that, but, you know, just, you know, it's slapstick, it's, you think the person's going to walk past the banana peel and they slip on it, sometimes they go around it, that's the, you know, but anyway, it's an unexpected outcome, but to think that that's a path to true wisdom, 
you're setting yourself up for an intellectual pratfall, <laughs> I guess. I'll, so uh, that's my closing thought. And I know you have to go. So Ashley McCray, what's yours? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I think to add to your point, I mean, a big part of why we enjoy comedy and what we do when uh, creators uh, things uh, have bad politics or do bad things, um, I think a part of it is just how much does it relate to the art and should that make us uncomfortable? So, for example, I don't think that um, Bill Cosby's humor works anymore because the whole point of Bill Cosby's act is that he's this like friendly, lovely uncle type. And then when you know who Bill Cosby really is, uh, that doesn't work anymore. Right. Um, right. Whereas I think you can look at Scott Adams uh, kind of subverting some of the more absurd things about office life. And you can enjoy those micro observations, but just remember that just because someone points out something or appears to be satirizing something, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely opposed to that system or that uh, they are on your side. And you kind of have to think more about the intentions of satire or of comedy and how it relates to the author and, and you know, don't assume that just because someone something makes you laugh means that the person is a, a brilliant person who you agree with on all things. Right. Fair enough. And the article is entitled The Adams Principle. You can find it at Current Affairs, the author and my guest, Ashling McRae. So as always, Ashling, thanks for uh, the great writing. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.